qui moi structures right pyramids temples megaliths exactly many of them have stones that are just so huge or so perfectly fitted maybe strangely shaped that the standard explanations are well they just don't always seem to fit do they they really don't sometimes so let's forget simple ramps and ropes for a moment we've got two fascinating sources today. One's a uh, recent book proposing a pretty radical idea involving ancient chemistry. Mm, and the other is a surprisingly connected historical text, 19th century, about something called soluble glass. Okay, soluble glass. And yeah, for centuries, the sort of accepted archeological line has been brute force, hasn't it? Pretty much. Thousands of laborers, lots of willpower, pounding stones, dragging things. And look, that definitely played a part, no doubt. But these sources you brought, they dig into something totally different. What if it wasn't just muscle? What if they were using, like, sophisticated chemical knowledge? Exactly. What if the stones weren't always carved, with immense difficulty, but maybe softened, altered, or, you know, even created using chemistry we've basically forgotten? So that's our mission for this deep dive. We're going to unpack these sources, see if they offer a shortcut, maybe, to understanding these ancient puzzles. Look at the anomalies they point out, unpack the science. Yeah, and see if this uh, forgotten chemistry can shed some new light. So get ready, you might look at ancient stones in a whole new way after this. Let's get into it. Okay. So let's start with what the first source, this natrontheory.pdf, calls the mystery of the uncarved stone. The author points out features in ancient stonework, all over the world really, that are just incredibly difficult maybe impossible to explain just with pounding and carving. And their big example is that absolute monster, the unfinished obelisk, right? Still lying there in the quarry in Aswan, Egypt. That's the one. It's huge. It's partly detached from the bedrock, and it looks like someone just downed tools one day. Right. And the traditional story is what? Workers chipping away with harder stones? Yeah, carving it out of the granite bedrock. Using handheld pounding stones, dolerite, which is harder than granite, you picture people just hammering away, slowly making these trenches around it. Okay, the official explanation. All right. But the source says, hang on, there are some serious holes in this story. What are they? Well, first, something kind of simple but telling. The author notes that tourists, you know, they sometimes pick up the original Dolorani pounding stones left at the site. Uh-huh. And they try hammering the granite. And they find they often just can't replicate the marks you see on the obelisk or the quarry floor. It's like not much happens. Hmm. So maybe it's harder than it looks, or the tools don't work quite like we think on the stone today. Could the stone have changed? That's possible. Mm -hmm. Or the method was different. And then there are the experiments. The source mentions an archaeologist, Reginald Engelback, back in the 1920s. He claimed he could pound the granite out fairly quickly. But then a more recent Slovak research team, just in 2023, they actually measured the volume you could remove this way, and their calculations showed it would take incredibly longer. We're talking years, maybe decades, for just one obelisk that size. Decades. Wow. That really clashes with ideas about how fast some of these big projects went up, isn't it? It does. Agonizingly slow, if this is the only method. And there's another problem, just the physical layout of the quarry. What about it? The source highlights these deep, narrow, vertical shafts. They're cut right next to the main trench around the obelisk. Now, if you're just pounding horizontally from the side to free the block, mm. why cut deep vertical holes? Mm, good point. Seems unnecessary. And the author argues it's basically physically impossible to swing a heavy pounding stone effectively down in those cramped shafts <laughs> or to generate enough force pounding upwards from below to carve out the bottom. Can you imagine trying to bash a heavy rock upwards in a narrow pit? No, that sounds, yeah, not feasible at all. So the author puts all this together. Trouble replicating marks, the extreme slowness, the weird quarry layout, the impossible angles for pounding, and just concludes the traditional theory for the unfinished obelisk is incorrect. Simple yeah. as that. That doesn't add up. Right. So if not pounding, then what? What's the alternative? They propose something completely different, mm. chemically altering the stone. And their research focuses on natrum. Natron. Okay, I've heard of that. It was common in ancient Egypt, right, from salt lakes. Exactly. Places like Wadi Al Tun. Chemically, it's mostly sodium carbonate, natos. Mm -hmm. And the source details experiments showing that molten natron can actually dissolve granite. Dissolve granite? Really? How does that work? Well, granite is mostly silica, COA. Think of silica as the main stuff, the sort of glue holding the granite crystals together. 
The experiments described show that when you heat natron up to its melting point, around 851 degrees Celsius, which they could definitely reach with ancient furnaces, bellows, charcoal, mm. it becomes liquid. And when this molten natron touches the granite, it reacts with the silica. And this reaction breaks down that glue, effectively dissolving or breaking apart the stone structure. Okay, so molten natron attacks the granite chemically. What's the actual reaction? What does it produce? The source explains it pretty simply. You heat natron, the sodium carbonate, with silica, the psychothiuro. They combine. The natron basically gives up sodium to react with the silica, and it produces sodium silicate natoio, that's also known as water glass. Water glass. Though. And it releases carbon dioxide gas, CO, which would cause bubbling. So yeah, the natron melts, reacts with the stone, turns part of it into this liquidy, glassy stuff, water glass. Water glass. That sounds like something from, I don't know, an old chemistry set or maybe old-fashioned industry. It is. And the source points out this process probably meant keeping the molten natron separate from the charcoal fuel, maybe in some kind of container. Right. You wouldn't want it mixing. And here's a really interesting bit. They speculate about tomb paintings, like the one in Reckmeyer's tomb. It shows Egyptians heating something in a handled copper pot over embers and pouring it out, often thought to be metalworking. Mm -hmm. But they suggest, maybe it's actually showing this chemical process, a copper pot could hold molten natron, briefly anyway. It would probably melt if you tried that with molten metal. Huh, that's clever. And this leads us to the second source, doesn't it? That 19th century document about soluble glass. Exactly. So what is soluble glass and how does it connect back to this ancient natron idea? Well, soluble glass is pretty much the same stuff we were just talking about. Alkaline silicates, like sodium silicate, water glass. And this 19th century text is amazing because it lists all these practical uses for it. They were apparently well known back then. Practical uses? Like what? what were people in the 1800s doing with this stuff? Oh, it was incredibly versatile, according to the text. Things like fireproofing wood. They'd apply it to wooden roof shingles, right? Make them resistant to catching fire. They'd only char if you held a flame right to them. Wow, okay. That's useful. And waterproofing walls. Cellars. Yeah. Making tough cements for setting iron into stone. Or for aquariums. Even preserving wood by soaking it. Fireproofing shingles, waterproofing basements. I mean, these are really practical, everyday problems they were solving with it. It shows this wasn't just some lab curiosity recently. Absolutely. The text specifically mentions coating shingles, how effective it was. It talks about using silicated cement for waterproofing cellars, how it improves mortar by forming this silicate film, making it way denser and more durable. This chemistry was part of practical know-how. Okay, so... How does the first source, the natron theory one, connect this more recent knowledge back to ancient stones, like in Egypt? One really compelling link the author makes is about the incredible polish you see on those granite sarcophagi in the Serapeum, you know, near Memphis. Underground complex. Yeah, those black boxes, they look impossibly smooth. Exactly. The theory is that's not a physical polish from rubbing for years and years. Mm -hmm. It's actually a coating of water glass, sodium silicate, applied as a liquid or maybe a gel. That coating. Yeah. Water glass hardens. And the source suggests that over a very long time, especially somewhere dry like the Serapeum, it reacts slowly with carbon dioxide from the air. And this reaction essentially vitrifies it, turns it into a super hard glass-like silica layer. So the stone isn't polished smooth. It's coated with a kind of ancient glass finish. That's the idea. And the 19th century soluble glass text backs this up. It notes soluble glass was used as a coating, and that it does react with atmospheric gyro. The first source explains that a slow reaction is key. It avoids problems like efflorescence, that white powdery stuff you see on bricks sometimes, and lets this hard vitrified layer form over centuries. Huh. Okay, so it shows the basic chemistry wasn't unknown, just maybe applied differently or on a massive scale back then? Right. It makes the idea seem less out there. Okay, so we've got softening stone, coating stone. But the first source goes even further, right? It suggests they could actually make artificial stone from scratch using these chemical methods. Yeah, this is maybe the most uh, radical part of the whole theory. The natrontheory.pdf source argues pretty strongly for widespread use of artificial stone. Geopolymers, basically. Geopolymers, like concrete. Sort of. It suggests structures like the Egyptian pyramids, maybe even megalithic sites in Peru, sexy homans, Silistani, weren't built entirely with quarried and carved blocks, but with blocks that were cast or molded in place. 
They build on work by people like Joseph Davidovitz, who first proposed the pyramid blocks were a type of geopolymer concrete. Artificial stone for the pyramids, that's a massive claim. What kind of recipes or processes does the source think they might have used? It describes a few possibilities based on materials they had and modern experiments. For example, a limestone-based cement or adhesive, possibly linked to Imhotep even. Imhotep's recipe. Allegedly. It would involve mixing natron and quicklime that's just limestone that's been burned, calcined with water, and limestone that's rich in clay. The quicklime reacts with the water and the other stuff, and it creates a binder. Okay, that's for limestone. What about things that look like granite? For a fake granite, the source talks about experiments using water glass again. They found if you mix water glass, specifically a gel form, silica hydrogel, with granite dust or gravel, you get a mix that sets into a hard, stone-like material. So just mixing dust and gravel with this gel? Pretty much. And they found adding alcohol, like ethanol, to the water glass first helps control how fast it sets, makes it easier to work with. Yeah. So the results are basically granite bits glued together by this silica gel binder. So they could potentially take local rubble, add some chemicals, and cast a new stone block. That's the theory. And this casting idea offers explanations for some really baffling features you see on ancient stones, like those weird bumps or protrusions, often called nubs. Ah, oh, the nubs, yes. You see them all over the place in Peru, like Cusco, Sacsayhuaman, even Greece on the Acropolis stones. They're strange. They are strange. Traditional ideas range from, you know, lifting points to decoration, but none really fit perfectly, especially when you find them on the inside faces of walls sometimes. Right. So what's the artificial stone explanation for the nubs? The source proposes a very specific function, especially yeah. for that limestone recipe with natron and quicklime. Remember that reaction makes a binder? Well, a byproduct is sodium hydroxide, NaOH, lye, basically. It's a highly alkaline liquid. Okay. If that liquid isn't removed while the artificial stone mix is hardening, it can cause efflorescence later on. That white powdery crust you get on concrete or brick walls sometimes, that's salts migrating out. Ah, uh, efflorescence, I know that. So the nubs were drains <laughs> to let the nasty stuff out. That's the theory. They acted as drainage points to wick out that excess sodium hydroxide liquid as the mix dried and hardened in its mold or casing. The source points out that in walls where they think this was used, typically either all the stones have nubs, sometimes they're rotated inward so you don't see them, or none of them do, if maybe a different recipe was used. Huh. That suggests a functional purpose, not just random decoration or lifting points. Exactly. A consistent design choice related to the production method. And this casting idea, it also helps explain other weird things that are hard to do with carving, right? Absolutely. Things like stone in stone you see at Saxe Woman, where one block looks partly embedded in another. Almost impossible to carve like that. Yeah, how would you even do that? Or decorative patterns on some dolmens. There's one mentioned in Galenzik, Russia. Yeah. They look less carved and more like they were pressed into something soft. Or figurines like the Puma at Kutimbo in Peru that seem sculpted onto the stone surface, not carved out of it. Right, like adding clay to a pot. Kind of. And even the contrasted Silistani, those towers in Peru. The outside faces are beautifully finished, smooth, perfect joints, but the inside masonry is much rougher. The source presents this as evidence they were cast using a casing or mold for that perfect exterior finish rather than being solid carved blocks. Okay, wow, this paints a dramatically different picture, but if they were using natron, quick lime, making water glass on a huge scale for softening or casting stone, where did they get all that stuff? We're talking vast quantities for pyramids or massive walls. That's the crucial question, isn't it? And the source looks into it. Mineral sources are one thing, like the Wadi El Natron Salt Lakes for Natron. But the source notes, modern supply from those lakes is actually quite limited, which raises the possibility that ancient mining on a huge scale might have depleted the easy-to-get deposits. Okay, so maybe they used up the surface stuff. Possibly. And interestingly, that 19th century soluble glass text also hints at related chemical processing. It mentions bittern the liquid left after salt crystallizes from brine as a source for something, and even mentions hydrofluoric acid as a potential fix for problems with soluble glass coatings. That suggests a wider chemical knowledge connected to mineral processing. Hmm. But what about other sources beyond lakes and mines? Plants. The source really digs into getting potash or natron from burning plants. Burning plants. Yeah. When you burn plants, especially ones that tolerate salty conditions like kelp or maybe quinoa or even just regular wood, the ash is rich in potassium carbonate, 
that's potash or sodium carbonate, which is chemically close to natron. Okay. And the source points to historical examples, like the potash craze in Europe, 18th, 19th centuries. The potash craze, that sounds dramatic. It was. It was a full-on industrial activity in places like Scotland, Hungary. People were clearing forests and harvesting huge amounts of seaweed, kelp, just to burn it all down to get the potash needed for making glass, soap, textiles. Industrial scale burning. Yes. The source quotes historical accounts describing shocking deforestation. Hundreds of acres of forest burned just to get enough ash for maybe one factory or a large building project. Wow. So the implication is ancient civilizations might have done the same thing, burning forests on an industrial scale to get materials for construction? That's exactly what the source speculates that the demand for natron or potash for these massive building projects or maybe other industries we don't know about could have driven huge industrial-scale burning of vegetation back then. And that could have had major consequences. Potentially massive ones. They even float the idea that this could have contributed to big environmental shifts, like the desertification of the Sahara. It really highlights how ancient human activity could have had landscape-level impacts we don't always consider. That's, yeah, that's a profound thought. Ancient industry changing the climate or the landscape. And the source also makes a point about how easily complex knowledge can just vanish. Yes. They use this fascinating example from Hungary, the local nature and collection industry. It was this really specialized, complex, local knowledge system, knowing exactly where to find the best nature deposits, how to gather it, how to process it. Uh -huh. And yet, within living memory, that entire industry, all that specific know-how, just completely disappeared, not because of a war or a plague or anything catastrophic. But why? Simply because circumstances changed. People started buying store-bought detergents. Industry found cheaper. Imported sources for sodium carbonate. The local knowledge just wasn't needed anymore. It became irrelevant, and so it was just forgotten. Wow, that's a powerful point. Knowledge doesn't need a cataclysm to get lost. It can just fade out when life moves on. Exactly. And that ties straight back to our second source, right? The 19th century soluble glass text. It shows that some of these very chemical processes, these practical applications, were known relatively recently, yet they seem to have been overlooked or maybe not connected by fields like archaeology when looking at ancient building techniques. The knowledge was there, but maybe siloed, not synthesized across different fields. Precisely. It wasn't connected up. So bringing this all together then, these sources are presenting a really compelling, okay, maybe radical, but compelling alternative to the standard story of ancient construction being mostly about brute force. Yeah, they propose sophisticated chemical techniques using stuff that was actually available like natron and water glass. This idea that stones could be softened or even cast as artificial blocks. It offers plausible explanations for so many of those weird anomalies that have puzzled people for ages. Like the perfect fits, the strange shapes, the impossible angles, the nubs. Exactly. It provides potential answers for those. And the sheer scale of materials needed, while huge, wasn't maybe impossible. If you consider mineral sources and this potential for industrial scale plant burning, like we saw later with the potash craze. Right. And the fact that soluble glass had real practical uses in the 19th century makes it feel more plausible that ancient cultures could have known and used similar chemistry. It really asks us to rethink how technologically sophisticated ancient civilizations might have been, doesn't it? Maybe they were masters of chemistry, not just amazing engineers and organizers. Because that's the core of it. And that leaves us, and you listening, with a really provocative thought to chew on. If ancient civilizations were potentially making artificial stone, manipulating materials with sophisticated chemistry, maybe on an industrial scale, what other parts of our understanding of the past might be fundamentally incomplete? Mm. What other valuable knowledge, practical knowledge perhaps, might have just faded away, just like that Hungarian natron industry? leaving us staring at mysteries that once had perfectly rational scientific explanations, it really makes you wonder what else is hiding in plain sight, just waiting for us to connect the dots across time and different fields of knowledge. It definitely suggests that some ancient mysteries might just be gaps in our knowledge of their science. 